You said that we owe literature almost everything we are and what we have been. If books disappear, history will disappear, and human beings will also disappear. I am sure you are right. Books are not only the arbitrary sum of our dreams and our memory, they also give us the model of self-transcendence. Some people think of reading only as a kind of escape, an escape from the real, everyday world to an imaginary world, the world of books. Books are much more. They are a way of being fully human. My name is Henry Wessels. I work with uh, James Cummins Books in New York, and it's another New York Book Fair, which is the roller coaster ride between tedium and great bits of commerce and discoveries. My PhD is in 16th century Spanish lyric poetry, which explains why I'm totally broke. After 15 years of academia, I left that in order to become an antiquarian book dealer. So I have had the pleasure of having really fantastic. As you can see, I deal in really big books, so I really like it when some of them go away. Lift it up and put it back where it was. Oh, God. About a third of what I do is I broadly refer to as esoterica, which is to say cult material, demonology, witchcraft, fetishism, subculture, and counterculture. I'm fond of saying the more uncomfortable a piece makes other dealers, the more likely it is to appeal to me. New York is the best antiquarian book fair in the world, mostly because of location. Slap bang in the middle of where you want to be on the Upper East Side and in a uh, gorgeous historical building. And a gorgeous historical building which is slightly overripe as well. This building, you know, has been here since the Civil War. But after that period in the early 1900s, this floor we're standing on now used to be tennis courts. So as a young man, I used to play tennis in this great building. I went to the opening this year. And when they've asked me, do you want me to show you this, see me looking at something in a glass case, I always say no. Don't bother showing it to me because I promise you I don't happen to have $85,000 to buy a book. One person did show me a book even though I told her I cannot buy this. Would you like to see? That's okay. Would you like to look at it? I said yes. So she was nice enough to show it to me. I'm afraid even to touch a book like that. I feel my life would turn into a Henry Short story. Now I have to spend all my money for the rest of my life trying to pay you back for this thing. I was surprised at how cavalier people were around the books. I saw a guy put a drink on a book. If he did that in my house, I'd kill him. The world is divided between people who collect things and people who don't know what the hell these people are doing collecting things. And if you're a collector, you're just a you know, sick, obsessive, compulsive person who would sell your grandmother to buy something that you really like, even if it's like an Elvis plate. For me, it's like a fantasy fair. Unlike going to the Morgan Library or the New York Public or the Library of Congress, everything's for sale. What rare book dealers really do is inculcate neophytes into the, the wonder of the object of the book. When you go to a rare book dealer, they're cultivating customers, all the good ones are, for 10, 20, 30 years. So the rare book dealers are transmitting the ability to learn how to appreciate the, the books. 
I just was there with a friend who's a fantastic novelist from Spain. And he almost started crying when I, I showed him the fourth or fifth edition of Don Quixote de la Mancha, published in Brussels in 1611 during the lifetime of, of uh, Cervantes. But that's not when he cried. He cried when, well, he cried a little when he saw the prize of $120,000. But then he cried, he really cried when he saw that the first edition of Ian Fleming's Casino Royale described by him was $130,000. That will make anyone cry. It's very significant, I think, that the, the clock in the armory is actually stuck at an impossible time. It doesn't actually exist, the time that it indicates. Like a casino, the good book fair hall has no clocks, you've got no sense of time. Sometimes it feels as if you're actually on a spaceship being sent to repopulate a distant galaxy with a slightly odd <laughs> choice of, of genetic markers, but nevertheless. Certainly collecting books used to be a very rarefied pursuit. It wasn't everybody who did it, it was the noble men of England. The typical picture of a book collector was an older man in a tweed jacket with elbow patches. And, and a pipe. And a pipe. <laughs> and a glass of sherry. They seem to always be wearing tweed. <laughs> and I think a lot of people, when they think of what is a rare book dealer, they may turn to Movies, I think television, I think popular literature. No, I was just... The video arcade is down the street. Here we just sell small rectangular objects. They're called books. You here? Hello, Whitkin. You didn't waste much time. Listen, there's a small fortune in there. Help yourself. You're a vulture, Corso. A vulture. Who isn't in our business? Pardon the mess. Are you a writer? I'm a book dealer. Would you happen to have a Ben Hur 1863rd edition with a duplicated line on page 116? We put that on one side for Miss Hanf. It would be a very interesting sort of mental Rorschach test to stop somebody on the street and say, if I say rare book dealer, what do you think of? You know, and they're not going to think of, you know, some runway model. They'll probably think of an older person. Everybody has their own idea, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful and romanticized idea. And if you walk around one of the big antiquarian book fairs in America, you're going to see people who sort of fit that mold. Well, in the 20th century, the most important bookseller in the English-speaking world was unquestionably A.S.W. Rosenbach. And he reigned supreme until the 1950s. This is from the classic Rosenbach biography by Edwin Wolfe II and John Fleming. Abraham Simon Wolf Rosenbach had plump pink cheeks, a twinkle in his eye, walked, as a friend once said, as a penguin would walk if a penguin could walk like Rosie, puffed everlastingly on a pipe or cigar, drank a bottle of whiskey a day, and was the greatest antiquarian bookseller the world has seen. Without much pressing, he would admit as much. The doctor, as he was familiarly known to collector friends and employees, for decades bought most of the important rare books and manuscripts sold at auction in England and America. Leona Rosenberg and Madeleine Stern were dealers who began right after the war around 1944-45. And they had an enormously long career spanning, over 60 years, as partners. And when they first started, this was very unusual because they were women dealers in pretty much majority man's world, at least on the level of business owners. And they really made a name for themselves early on, selling incredible finds to libraries. And they became famous for taking trips to Europe and bringing back these things, discoveries that no one realized were still around. One thing that's great about Rostenberg and Stern is that they discovered that Louisa May Alcott had a secret life as a pulp writer, often a very sexy, very violent pulp writer. They're the ones who put it together, who found the pseudonyms, who found the material, and were able to piece together this whole part of an American writer's life that people hadn't fully realized was happening. I got nothing yet. Rob Tuckman said no, Mike Wallace said no. Jimmy Robinson can't play. Right.
Yeah. All right. And you heard nothing from this dad character? No. Let me think of who else. I, I kind of, believe it or not, has a film crew here at the moment. You have a film crew in your apartment? Yeah. So it, Why? Uh, a friend of mine's doing a documentary on booksellers, and guess what? I'm a bookseller. So there. Oh my God! I know so many booksellers that are more appropriate than you, <laughs> and better looking, better looking too. <laughs> Great. How did you get in the book business? Oh, I always kind of joke, not fit for anything else. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what am I going to do with the rest of my life, and there was this little bookshop in Queens I used to stop in on my way to and fro, and I ended up buying. Actually, that set of books, the four volumes of the Cooey's editing of Lewis and Clark's journals. He had it in the window for $75, which was more than I had ever spent on a book before. Oh, my God. I saved up my money for a couple of weeks, and I was able to buy it, and he needed someone to work part-time, and next thing I knew, I was in the book business. All right, so this is a photo album from 1907 titled The Search for Mammoth. So this expedition found this fabulous frozen mammoth and they dug it out of the mud and blah, 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 blah. But what makes this album really special, they actually mounted a couple examples of actual mammoth hair into the back of the album. So that's real mammoth hair from, you know, probably 15,000 years ago. Two down, two down. I'm out here almost every day. How many teams do you play on? Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, seven. And I sub on an eighth, but only sporadically. So, so it's not every day. Night. Pretty much. Yeah. How long have you been in this world? 18, 19 years. 98. So that's 19 years, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> that's frightening. <laughs> Basically, it took me three months to move. I'd get up in the morning, I'd come here, I'd spend the day building bookcases and sheetrocking and everything else. I'd go home, I'd pack books until midnight, go to sleep, get up in the morning again, ride my bike here, and build more bookcases, and on and on and on ad nauseum. It's gotten to the point where every time I buy another book, I have to rearrange the entire place. I have no way to put anything anymore. This is a thing on the catacombs of Rome that is so heavy that I haven't taken it off the shelf since I put it on the shelf 15 years ago. I brought it to one fair and I said, never again. So there it sits, you know, and until somebody comes that happens to come over and says, you got anything on the catacombs of Rome by any chance? Where is it? Where are you? This is a late 18th century monograph on these fossil fish. And it's a big book with these fabulous plates of, uh, of fossil fish. And they're all life size, which means that the big fish have really big plates. Oh, we got things like that. But they get even bigger than that. You know, Playboy, eat your heart out, you know? <laughs> The Strand was founded by my grandfather in 1927 in an area that was famous in New York. It was called Book Row. There were 48 bookstores at its height, and today The Strand is the only one left. My dad came in working at age 13. He always wanted to be on the main floor. His book buying desk was front and center. I encountered the most lovable, eccentric, charming human beings I've ever known in my life on those 4th Avenue bookstores. One of the things I remember about those guys, they were all guys that were like all little dusty Jewish men who were very irritated if you wanted to buy a book because they were not really in business. They were there so they could read all day. And if it was, you know, warm, they would be sitting outside like on a box. They were covered in dust. Their hands were yellow from nicotine. They always had glasses, of course, because they've been reading in the dark since they were, you know, six years old. And if you would, like, go up to them and ask very politely, how much is this book? Half the time, they wouldn't even look up. 
I always imagined I would be like that if I owned a bookstore. And you could just crawl around in there and you would find stuff. They didn't know what they had. If you could get his attention, he'd make up a price. But the price would be like 40 cents. So I like that. But the Strand was never like that because it was so big. But very often I would find books at the Strand. I would bring them to the guy and he would go, where did you find this? And then I would say, oh, you know, behind that door. He said, you're not supposed to go there. You know, that stuff hasn't even been priced yet. So I think part of my um, affection for this is crawling around in the bookstore, which I still do even though you're not supposed to do that. I'm really sorry I never took photographs over the years of our street. It has changed dramatically. Originally, 59th Street was a two-way street, and it had a two-way trolley going across town. It was started by our father in 1925. He was one of the Fourth Avenue book dealers. When he opened the store, he didn't have enough books to fill the shelves, so he would put books sideways to take up room. We would come down on Saturdays and sharpen pencils, browse in the children's I remember section. wanting to work here during college in the summer, but I couldn't type, so he wouldn't hire me. <laughs> and I got a job doing something else elsewhere. And the same thing happened the next summer. Can you type yet? No. So he wasn't, was he wasn't aching to bring us in. People always asked him, how did you get all three daughters to work for you? And he would just say, I guess I'm just lucky. But actually, it was because he never let us know that's what he wanted. We all decided on our own, we thought. My mother was very important. She joined the business when I was 10 years old. She was fantastic. She created the second floor gallery. She told my father, don't ask the girls to go into business with you. She was the one who was wise. We are on the top floor of our building. It's the autograph department. I started it just to have my own space among a lot of sisters. I'm a huge baseball guy, so I love all the signed baseballs that we have. I think we have Bill Clinton who signed a baseball just sitting on the desk there. But it, it gets really random. There's colonial money that might be signed. And sometimes it's in different languages and it's handwritten and the handwriting is impossible. And it's like a constant scavenger hunt. So why have you guys been able to stay open when so many have closed? Real estate, we own the building. Our father had the foresight to buy this building and we've had many offers. The brokers call five, ten times a week to try to get us to sell the building, and uh, it's not happening. Won't say there's no amount of money that it wouldn't happen, but no amount that they're offering. It would mean going out of business. And we like being here. So in essence, we're paying for the privilege of working here. It used to be that if I was in Midtown and I had like an hour between things to do, I would just go into a bookstore. And I always say to people, you know what they used to call independent bookstores? Bookstores. All bookstores were independent. The people who worked there were real booksellers. They decided what would go on the window, what would go on the counter. It's not like when Barnes & Nobles came in, which now people who are young constantly say to me, oh, my Barnes & Nobles closed. And I think, we hated Barnes & Nobles. They put everyone out of business. It was an old school looking store. Just books everywhere. We had a pretty cool cat, Linda. This was Skyline Books. 13 West 18th Street. My specialties were beats, photography, art. I think we were known as like, as a store for collectors. I was behind in rent. It was an easy decision. I had to get out. Business was way down. People were shopping online. It was a really awful time for me. You know, we had these horrible sales at the end, like 75% off. I think at one point, we were 90% off. It was a good shot, we had our day, no doubt. In the 1950s, there were 368 bookstores in New York City. Today, I went and counted, and there were 79.
The evaporation of the general used bookstore has had a real impact because that was for generations a really traditional path into the trade. As a kid growing up in suburban Delaware in the 70s, I mean, my real exposure to the history of print culture was through used bookshops. That was the chance to just keep seeing different copies and get a sense. I lived in bookstores, you know, that were available, either new, used. I mean, I would go from New England to New Jersey, stopping all along the way at used bookstores. Road trips were basically a, a important source of material. And we filled a station wagon full of books, shipped boxes back. It was book selling in the old style. People don't have the patience to go look at a shelf of books like that. The average buyer wants to buy a particular book. I mean, it takes a certain kind of interest in books to begin with to even arrive at the stage at which you want to be surprised by something, that you want to find what you aren't looking for. You've got to see a lot of material. That's the only way to really know how to price books. And the more copies you see, the more you can know when it's just an ordinary book that needs an ordinary price or where there's something to apply your imagination to. And I have a pretty good imagination at times. My first job in books was at The Strand when I was a teenager. And watching Fred Bass handle thousands of books coming across the transom just every day, the way that he sorted them so fast, I'd show up with his lunch and I'd, you know, I'd look at the books and say, oh, that's a good one. And he'd be like, no, it's not. I mean, watching him do it like that so fast, I felt like, I think I know about books. I think I understand what books are. But he sees something in these objects that I can't even begin to understand. I mean, one thing that's happened in New York City in just the past year has been a kind of explosion of street level, brick and mortar, used and antiquarian bookshops devoted to post-war avant-garde material. But it's no substitute for the kind of general antiquarian bookshop that, you know, you used to see around. So this is our new store, or going to be our new store. We're in the West Village. This is a shoot store currently. Uh, we're taking it over. We got the keys yesterday. We're gonna open in March. I mean, I think we're part of a real boom in independent bookshops that are really kind of communally based, that really engage with their neighborhood and, you know, sort of address the interests and the needs of the people that live locally in a way that the old chain stores never did. Just one second. Adam Weinberg of Rare Books, how can I help you? It's a little hard to hear you, so oh, you said plays from the 1800s? You fill up storages and storages of books, so I got a little overwhelmed in storage. I didn't want to pay Manhattan storage prices <laughs> any longer, so I thought it'd be better to stick everything in a studio apartment, you know, make it look nice. Kansas. Adam Weinberger, Rare Books, how can I help you? Uh, sure, what are the books? They're all, uh, you know, parchment or vellum leaves, so you can imagine how many cows <laughs> it takes to make one of these things. You know, it's, it's always hard to tell whether someone's willing to sell or not. Once I showed up at somebody's apartment, uh, you know, with uh, empty banker's boxes, which are very good for transporting books, but, uh, you know, this old woman opened the door and she was basically looked at my empty boxes and was like, you're not going to be needing those today. And I understand that's like you go in and you suddenly show up with boxes. It's like you're going to ravage their, you know, collection that they've had for decades or something. So he bought all of them from Gotham directly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, a big cat lover like you, so uh, uh, that's why I particularly fancy Gory. <laughs> mm. A lot of the uh, general beat material, if it's you know, not signed, or if it's not in the original dust jackets, not the early ones, you know, it's a, there's 10 copies of everything mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. And that goes for most Kerouac things, yeah. Yeah. In August of 72, this is an apartment that belonged to my uncle Jack Allentuck and his wife Marcia Allentuck. They were both academics. So I'm dealing with everything that they left me, a lot of stuff. I think you could call this the detritus of their lives. This was an interesting sounding one. The woman was a professor of art history. She was a, a scholar in Blake and people in the romantic circle. So immediately my 
ears pick up, I think there's potential. Yeah, I always take a peek just to see. There can be some decent ones in here. Every apartment, you get a sense of adrenaline. It's exciting. You know, you're basically in a place where somebody has put their life energy into it. And not only their physical presence, but their intellectual energy and their being. And you see what they were thinking, what they were interested in. More has changed in the last 15 years in this pursuit than changed in the previous 150 years. For generations, there were people, runners, book scouts, whatever you want to call them, who existed on the periphery of the book world, using their knowledge to connect books with dealers that they knew. They'd go out and they'd hit church sales and estate sales and library sales and so forth. And it was a very happy symbiotic relationship. Now, book scouts, they are a vanishing breed. The legendary uh, runner of modern times was Martin Stone. Very charismatic rock and roller, great musician, important. Nearly a rolling stone when traveling with his bands. he had a lot of time off, and he'd spend that time going around bookshops. An amazing book scout, great taste. Understood the connections between books. He was an encyclopedic mind at work. I've just found a very nice book, which is pleasing me extraordinarily. He was always surrounded by plastic bags and hold alls, this kind of thing. You know, he'd already done his shopping when you were just getting going in the morning. So he'd show you the things he'd bought and he'd quietly enthuse about why they were important. And I learned so much from him. Martin was one of those people who was often as not the jam in the sandwich as well as the sandwich, in that he knew so much and, and understood so well that, that he had taken all the way from, from the 50p box to, to the 10,000 pound vitrine. The business tragically changed with the rise of the computer. All of a sudden, all those 50, 75, 100, 125 dollar books became 20 or 25 or 30 dollar books, and there were a lot of copies of those books. It was almost harder in those days to find a relatively inexpensive book than it was to find a very expensive book because you had to go out and find it yourself. Basically, in the last 10 years, every piece of shit that's been laying around somewhere is suddenly out on the internet. So there's been this incredible upwelling of stuff, be it books or Beanie Babies or whatever it is. It's become ruined by the internet. It's great for collectors that the internet exists. They find books that they spent decades trying to find unsuccessfully in the past at the you know, touch of a key. But to be a surviving used bookseller really is mostly what I'm talking about, is almost impossible. Collecting is about the hunt. It's not about the object. You look for 20 years, and then you find it. You have your orgasm, and you put it on the shelf and never look at it again. The internet has killed the hunt. You know, if you collect Edith Wharton, if you give me your credit card in 45 minutes, I will build you an almost complete collection of Edith Wharton first editions. You know, done. Why bother? What's the point? The internet is always, for the antiquarian book business, going to be a double-edged sword. In the modern marketplace, you either have to have the best, the cheapest, or the only copy. What the internet did was to really change the way we talked about what was rare. For people at the top of the trade or dealing in really specialized material, the internet was a huge godsend because in a way it just validated their position. I have material you can't get. But for a lot of people who dealt in fairly common modern firsts, for example, it was devastating, you know, and it destroyed their livelihood and they've had to pivot or die. Buying and selling the way we do it now is a bit colder thing. It's the passing of an era of book selling. And while the internet's a great democratization of supply and demand, it also is taken some of the dark and murky and fun aspects of it away. One of the problems everybody in the trade faces these days is more and more the printed word is disappearing. I mean, you say the word Kindle, and I think you'll get some members of the book trade who feel a shudder go up their spine. And a lot of people wonder, where's the future of this industry going? If we don't have books printed anymore, and you can buy books directly sent to your electronic device without there ever being a hard copy, what are we going to sell? And I think that's a very fair concern. And I think a lot of people feel that. And probably the most incredible example of that was in 2006 at the Academy Awards, 
when Larry McMurtry, with his writing partner, was awarded Best Screenplay for an Adaptation from a Book for Brokeback Mountain. And finally, I'm going to thank all the booksellers of the world. Remember that Brokeback Mountain was a book before it was a movie. Uh, from the humblest paperback exchange to the masters of the great bookshops of the world, all are contributors to the survival of the culture of the book, a wonderful culture which we mustn't lose. Well, I just think there's a, continually a movement toward things that are more unique. Yes, people are less interested in modern firsts and more interested in ephemera, more interested in manuscripts, more interested in strange printed materials that in the past might not have been seen to be collectible but now seem to have a kind of cultural interest. It's technology that has made archives that much more interesting to institutions. We did a series of deals recently with the foundation in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the first one being for Woody Guthrie's papers and the second one being for Bob Dylan's papers. And the ability that these people have to take all the audiovisual material and turn it into a gold mine for users, for fans, for scholars, is remarkable. Ten years ago, you couldn't do it. I was clearing out my office and had all the material from all of my books, all my New Yorker stories, all of my notes and research. And I began thinking, this feels like something I shouldn't throw away. I've known Glenn for a long time, and I knew that he had actually sold other people's archives. He came and looked at what I had, and then we brainstormed about where it would go, knowing that it was most likely best suited in some academic library. That was a strange feeling, imagining yourself as homework for somebody. <laughs> the good thing is that it's now very organized and indexed, and the irony is that it's at Columbia University, and I have to go there this summer and look through my own archives for a book that I'm working on. But going forward, when so much work is being done on a computer, I wonder how we're going to really learn about writer's process, given the, the kind of invisible hand of computer editing. I think the difference between an archive and, say, something someone collected is that it contains the whole of the work, and it contains the messy bits and the unexpected bits. At the Schomburg, in terms of rarities, we have everything from Malcolm X's papers to Lorraine Hansberry's and James Baldwin's papers. And Baldwin was born and raised in Harlem, and he learned to read, some say, at the Schomburg Center, so it's very much him coming home here. And what I love about his archive is that it contains everything from notes for novels to the finished novels to the many drafts that he would do. There's notes taken in bars, there's things written on hotel stationery. There's the full array of Baldwin as a, a learning to be writer, including early poems and things like that, to him becoming the writer that we know and love. A curator is yet another role in the library, and the curator, which is what I was for years, thinks about the ways that material can not only come into the institution, but I think go out into the world. But I think also thinking about the collection in a holistic way, thinking about the future of the collection and what it means, how to show the connections within material. I do think it has to come, in some sense, with a love of the material. And that's what I had as a writer, but also as a book collector. So I had experience buying books. I actually knew booksellers who are very much partners in building collections. At the same time, what's really interesting is the way that collectors shape collections that end up at archives. And I think where we have been telling the story of black people's existence and black people's creativity and black people's cultural significance for nearly a century, I'm not sure we've, as a culture, a society, fully understood or taken in what all that meant. I never thought I would be a bookseller, to be honest, never. I had no idea that was my future. I started from high school when I graduated. I started working for J.N. Bartfield on 57th Street, specializing in finely bound sets. I worked there for 13 years. 
And then I decided it's time for me to quit. And so I started going to um, estate sales like six in the morning, five in the morning. I was just starting out, you know, at my parents' home, I, working in the basement in the Bronx. And I remember I went to an estate in Greenwich, Connecticut, and I was number one online. And I walked into the room, and there on the shelf, the beautiful set of Balzac works, like 40 volumes. And it was like maybe $200 for the set. And I went and I ran up. I said, these are mine. These are mine. Nobody touched these are mine. It was a fine. So I never forget that, never. It was, that's how it all started, funny enough. What we deal in is luxury items. I think books are still on the value. People don't appreciate the workmanship that goes into having a book bound today. And leather bound books need to be clean and polished. That's another thing that people don't know how to take care of. And oiling and polishing, as long as the books are in very good condition, once every five, 10 years is good. So even saying I'm a rare book dealer, the first question everyone asks is, what makes a book rare? If you say a rare book, you mean both hard to find and highly desirable. Scarcity just means hard to find. There's, I would say, three categories of people who buy books. There's private collectors, there's dealers for their stock, and also there's institutions. The problem in the trade today is private collectors are becoming increasingly scarce. We're just talking about the smell of old books and kind of the magic that is in, you know, some of these like beautiful editions. It was interesting to me how they decided to like how they priced various things. I think Maybe we both have very specific yeah. mm -hmm. research interests and if there's something cool, right. pick it up. It's not too expensive. Yeah, I, <laughs> I forgot to bring money and my credit card is maxed out. So, which is a good thing because I was tempted. <laughs> My parents were interested in antiques, and so I would be given five cents for every antique shop I behaved in. And always at the end of the day, we, we had enough nickels to buy a book. I began uh, collecting not intentionally rare books, but I liked the stories by Frank Baum of The Wizard of Oz. And at the age of 12, Columbia University was doing a centenary presentation of Frank Baum's writings, and they were looking for a few things they weren't able to find elsewhere. My parents noticed that newspaper article in the Times, and uh, consequently, I became the youngest lender to Columbia University in its 200-year history. And it was at a time when children's books themselves were not really thought of with any seriousness. You had famous books like Alice in Wonderland. But when I bought my first edition of The Wizard of Oz, certainly the person who sold it to me didn't realize it was the first edition, but it cost $5. I just loved dealing with books. It never seemed like work. It was in 1967 that uh, Marie Sendak was looking for early mechanical books by a man named Lothar Megendorfer. And I had a few of them, and we gradually developed a friendship. And by the time I had formed a corporation at the end of 1969, I felt it would probably be useful to have Murray Sendak design a catalog cover for us, which he agreed to do. And 
part of Maurice's genius in doing caricature was he drew both me and my business partner as teddy bears. I was wearing a proverbial waistcoat or vest. That was clearly me. And that began really the start of a much closer friendship. This is our gallery, which is on Broadway in Kingston. And we pretty much use it for storage nowadays. And the combination of Maurice Sendak, original art and posters, and also our other interest, which is Chinese propaganda with Chairman Mao. And Maurice, once who uh, came over to look at our gallery, said it's a Mao and Mo show. The Mao on one side and Sendak on the other. Mo was his nickname. I bought the most expensive American book ever sold in 1989 for a customer. It was Poe's first book called Tamerlane. They call it the black tulip of rare books of American literature. There are a handful of copies. And it had been found in a junk shop. It's a famous story. The guy paid 15 bucks for it, and I paid $200,000 for it. It makes a great coaster. In the upper cover, someone had put down a glass and there's a ring of the glass around the cover. The range of material that comes across my desk is maybe broader than for some people. I'm one of several people who have handled books bound in human skin. I've had two of them come across my desk. Both of them were English bindings on the Hans Holbein Dance of Death. One was bound by George Sutcliffe, the great English bookbinder, and it had a roundel of a skull made of bone and teeth. It was a powerful philosophical object. And some people didn't want to come within six feet of it, and others said, the natural question is, can I touch it? These are jeweled bindings. In the history of the book, these are the most beautiful bindings. In each copy of a jeweled binding, you would take a book to San Gorski and Sutcliffe, and they would encase it in 24 karat gold. They would put rubies and different gems all around the book, and you would then open the book between the gold. I think people are probably surprised to know that rare books go through vogues. <laughs> you know, I think they think, well, they're just old books. But there is definitely the time when, like, a perfect dust jacket was the thing in the trade in the 80s and even into the early 90s. It used to be they were just like the wrapping paper that the book came in. They were to keep the dust off while it was in the store. And then you threw that away and you had a pristine copy. If you take a copy, best example is F. Scott Fitzgerald, Great Gatsby. The first edition in very nice condition is a $5,000 book. A first edition with a tattered dust jacket, maybe a $15,000 book. The first edition with a fine dust jacket, complete what have you, is a $150,000 book. And it comes back, I believe, to the visual object of the, of the dust jacket. It's art. And thank God for collectors and rare book dealers who kept jackets and made us aware of the value not just monetarily, but of information. That's why I like jackets, is because, you know, someone's first book, they say very different things in their bio than they do in their 10th book. And I think that that kind of biographical information sometimes only appears there. Let's try to cover a book in Mylar. Um, we use the, uh, the five millimeter. <laughs> any luck, it fits on the book nicely. I've had, you know, book people tell me, if a book is signed to a specific person, and that person is famous, it makes it more valuable. If it's signed to, you know, Joe, and no one knows who Joe is, it makes it less valuable than if it's just signed. To me, this goes into, like, the stamp collecting category. I don't know about this. 
this notion of association copies of books inscribed from a writer to a significant figure in his or her life or a literary figure suddenly began to overwhelm the book business. Where prior to that, people were crazy about finding fine first editions and beautiful dust jackets. The jacket took a secondary place, for the most part, to major association copies. I'm open to any book that's sufficiently interesting, but I became interested in books that had some kind of special history. For me, the best books are usually, you know, they look like they've been run over by a truck, but they have to been run over by the right truck. As a general matter, rare is rare for a reason, and it's not because everybody in the world wants it usually. The people who appreciate something rare in the realm of books are just as rare as the, the things themselves usually. And opening now for the Enigma machine, and starting now, which is at 45,000, going on 50,000. At 50,000, now 55,000. Rare books, the field, really falls into what we call items of antiquarian interest. These are items that don't clearly fit into a paintings category or a furniture category naturally, and they often don't meet the same customers as a collectibles field. I think that's one thing that's shifted in the trade is things that used to be thought of as ephemera now are central to the trade. And they're central to collections in some ways because they help tell a slightly different story. It all falls under what I call the general heading of evidence. From the very beginning of my career, I was interested in dealing in that very, very broad base of historical evidence. And that was at a point when many traditional historians would have argued to you that visual material did not constitute evidence, as strange as it may seem to us now. I think a good bookseller absolutely is another kind of discoverer and historiographer and thinker of history. And they see it in its raw form, and the good ones of which there are many, and they also provide a really important context. That's why when you acquire things, you generally keep the descriptions they gave, because sometimes you see a box. It doesn't tell you that history that they understand and have done work to understand. I'm always very suspicious of people who are precious about, about the antiquarian book trade and the notion that we're some sort of guardians of sacred flames. That's too easy, too glib, but this stuff matters. Let me also make an argument for the importance of the printed physical object in the age of digitization. Physical objects often contain evidence that's part and parcel of their physical makeup, and that might be things like ownership, annotation, how the book has been treated by the owner, what kind of binding it's in, the paper it's printed on. There are all kinds of things you can find in the physical body of a book that tell a story in and of themselves. One of my closest friends and customers is a man named Michael Zinman. Michael formed one of the greatest collections of early printed material, things printed in the United States. Well, it's like this. I started asking myself, what's left of early printing in America? And the only way I found out was I went around and started buying and looking and asking. I never questioned if I had a book about buying a second book or a third book or a fourth copy. I just kept buying. And at some point, I started comparing what I had. You learn from what you have. You would start to find all kinds of variations. And you could really draw conclusions out of that that you never could have drawn from having one perfect copy of the book. Michael and I dubbed this the critical mess theory, that by building a big enough pile of the stuff and then looking at it, seeing what kind of connections and patterns we found, we would come up with more reliable historical thesis than if we set out with some notion of what we were going to prove and went to find the material to prove it. We're in Hackettstown, New Jersey, where they make M&Ms. You can't go to the factory, though. They don't, allow, they don't allow tours. We have our warehouses here. And we have about 300,000 books in three different units, from valuable books to $20 books. Every one of these shelves has a story, so I can tell you pretty much where every book came from and a story that goes with it. See, we still got a little space up there, <laughs> space here. up here. Oh, you can always buy another warehouse. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. Does it's... anyone have more books? Uh, well, Tom Congleton says he's, he's close. 
This is enough, believe me. Yeah, with 300,000 books, you can imagine once in a while they get misplaced. <laughs> so this whole section, from 10 shelves in each section, there are eight or nine sections here. So you got a lot of poetry, say nine sections times a thousand or, or more because poetry books are very thin. You got 10,000 books of poetry right in this aisle here. He thinks that poetry is coming back, whether it is or it isn't, I don't know. Whistler, this is all Whistler. This is all bindings here. And here's an unusual title, Amish Love. So, no pictures though. Oh, I guess there are pictures. Oh, yes, there are pictures. Wow, that's quite a picture. Jim doesn't just collect books, he collects everything. As you can see, we have a Masonic throne. We have tribal uh, masks from uh, God knows where. Don't know where we got the seagulls, but those, those were interesting as well. You know, it's like a treasure hunt, especially here in Six, but in, in all the warehouses, you never know what you're gonna find. Some dealers say you shouldn't collect if you're gonna be in competition with your customers. I try to avoid that, but I love collecting. And I love selling books. I don't, you know, once I buy a book, I don't mind selling it. This is part of the aviation collection over here, the lesser stuff. A lot of them, Amelia Earhart. We have a piece of the Hindenburg. We have a piece of the, where's that? And the other? It might be down the end of uh, this aisle. Then I have a big collection of purses. They're all up there and hats. Oh my God. The rare book trade is an ancient, ancient trade. It's existed for hundreds of years. The first auctions that were ever held in modern times in the 1600s were auctions in Britain of books. Now it's completely different. You had the introduction of telephone bidding and now internet bidding. I go to lots of auctions in New York and I've been at auctions where there have been three people and I'm one of them sitting in the room and then the auctioneer's the other and the rest of it's staff. 19,000, 20,000 gentlemen. At an auction like, let's say, the Frank Siebert sale in 1999, the strategy of how you conducted yourself when you could literally look across the room and see the person bidding against you and they could look back at you was different than bidding against a telephone bidder. At $300,000 on my right, at 300000 If you're in the room, you actually really still have an upper hand because you have a better sense of the rhythm of things. And you have the eye of the auctioneer. So you can speed things up, you can slow things down, you can play some mind games that way. It's fair warning now, 360000 on my right. 360833 Thank you very much. I'm fascinated with the history of auctions. I'm fascinated with the psychology of auctions. I'm fascinated with what drives people at auctions. And if you read some sort of auctions 101 article in any publication and, and the journalist is giving you the standard rules for attending an auction, every single one of them will always say as one of the cardinal rules, figure out what you want, set your limit, and stick to your limit. That's great, it makes great sense until it actually happens. And I've experienced this myself, so I don't think I'm speaking in the abstract about somebody else. If I want something, and I can afford something, I mean, my limit is the amount of money that's in my bank account. My limit is how much food I'm prepared not to eat next week because I can't afford it. I'm gonna do that. Ownership and possession and competition, I think, drive people to do very unexpected things. And from the podium, it's wonderful to see. Maybe you could tell me a little bit how you got into the business. Well, it's, the, it's a one-word answer. It's nepotism. And I'm third, definitely, generation antiquarian bookseller. My grandfather came over to London in 1888 to be in Pickering and Chateau. And my great uncles had stores in Cork and Dublin. And Joyce mentions the store in Dubliners. Nearly every day when his teaching in the college was ended, he used to wander down the quays to the second-hand booksellers, to Hickey's on Bachelor's Walk, 
to Webb's or Massey's on Aston's Quay, or to O'Clysey's in the by street. To give you an idea, perhaps, of some of the material that was available in the 20s, one could look, for example, to the availability of the original manuscript of Alice in Wonderland. Alice Liddell, Mrs. Hargreaves, as she later became, the Alice of Alice in Wonderland, sold the manuscript at Sotheby's. And my grandfather was at the sale in 1928. And Rosenbach succeeded in purchasing it for £15,400. In 1958, my father really started the book department proper at Christie's. And by 1964, I was the third person in there. In 1978, I sold the first Gutenberg Bible I handled for $2.2 million, and that was considered a huge prize. And in 1980, the Leonardo manuscript, the Leicester Codex, was sold to Arm & Hammer for the equivalent of about $5 million, which Christie's had considered a bit of a disappointment because it was touted as a collection of drawings rather than as a scientific manuscript. And by 1994, when it came round again, the interest in science had increased hugely. The Leonardo da Vinci Codex Hammer. 5,500 to start, 55, $5.5 million to start it. <laughs> Good start. Five I bungled it to start with. And people were laughing and that kind of thing. At 14 million in this room then, 15 million on the telephone. And it was free to sell million. at 15 million. And then it was the second row against the phone. Just two people all the way up. In this room at 23 million, 500,000, 24 million on the telephone. 25 million. Bill Gates certainly didn't come and see the manuscript. He bought it sight unseen. On the telephone in this room at 28 million dollars. Last call, 28 million. Thank you. And it remains by far and away the highest auction price for any book or manuscript. I think there's a world of difference between rare book auctions and art auctions. And I think one of the obvious differences is that when you're talking about books, they are not unique nor one of a kind. When you're talking about a painting, they are one of a kind. Now, there are certainly extremely rare books. There are exquisitely rare books of which only a few copies are known. But with the exception of illuminated manuscripts, with the exception of uh, medieval codex, for example, which would be one of a kind because they are manuscript and handwritten, these items are multiples. And I think that really affects the price. The antiquarian book trade is so established and so sort of grounded in history there really is no comparison. It's not just a difference of scale. I truly feel it's like a difference of gravity. I think books are not trophies in the same way that other fields in the art market are. Another bid, please. 400, 400 million. Collecting art is in many ways the not yours object of collecting. By my owning this picture, I deny you the right of ownership. I am the greater, bigger person because you can't have it, I have it. The people who collect rare books have a very deeply personal connection to the material that they are collecting. Books are going to be on a shelf in a library, so you almost have to be invited into the collector's mind a little bit more. The reason that there are many, many more art collectors than there are book collectors is because it's a display of wealth. It's boring and it's a cultural dead end. And I've never met a swaggering book speculator. I've never met that guy who's like, you know, owns houses all over the world because he just bought in right at the exact right moment for, you know, James Bond novels. First of all, when I was young, when I first came to New York, it was called the art world. Okay, now it's called the art market. I rest my case. I started out in the magazine business. I was working for AB Bookman's Weekly, which was the magazine that everybody in the trade read, love it or hate it. I was the managing editor and staff writer. I was also the first person they let go when they decided to close it down. The owner had made a lot of the wrong decisions about the impact of the internet, including declining an offer to partner with a new startup who wanted to get more exposure in the book world, um, a, a guy named Jeff Bezos on Amazon. 
This summer I finished writing a book I'd been working on for about a year and a half. It's entitled A Conversation Larger Than the Universe, and it's the subject of a Grolier Club exhibition. It's rooted in the books that I've been reading and thinking about for the last 25 years. And Mary Shelley is, for me, the starting point for science fiction. One of the metaphors that I play with in the course of my conversations is the idea of a walk in the woods. That's my favorite recreation, not necessarily with any aim in mind, but I keep my eyes open for edible wild mushrooms. Science fiction might appear like a forest to somebody who doesn't know anything about it, but their pathways, you can learn to identify the trees and the relationship between them. It also allows me to think about science fiction as a constantly renewing literary form. This book, the title is The Smell of Telescopes, and it's in the exhibit almost entirely because of the title itself. Of course, in 1986, when the artist was thinking about the future, yeah, payphones, along with uh, robotic eyes and, and you know, portable keyboards. Science fiction isn't about pr prediction, it's about looking what's going on right, right in front of you. If you have the gene to collect things, then you collect things. Needless to say, I have the gene, so does my father. The English has no word for what room I have is, but the Germans have an excellent word for it. It's a Wunderkammer, which is a cabinet of wonders. My library is unique in a variety of ways. This is the only library that I'm aware of in the world that's focused entirely on the history of human imagination in all of its many forms. And then it's also unique in that it's a purpose-built space that's about the subject. So the subject is imagination. The library is designed as an homage to Escher, who, needless to say, had quite an imagination. And then in the scale of a private library, this probably is, if you know, not the largest, one of the largest private libraries in the world. And then the library is unusual in that the books are organized randomly by height. So you create the connections in the library as opposed to me saying, here's the section on naval warfare and here's the section on flowers. We don't do that around here. And eventually, as we move into the virtual world, I fully expect the library will make the jump quite easily. And then as soon as 3D scanning gets to be good enough, my goal would be to 3D scan every book and manuscript and object in the room. And so that any 3D printer would be able to make anything that was out of copyright. Assuming I live long enough and I'm fortunate enough, that's just what I'll do. I don't know why I collect, and I seem to be at the extreme end of the uh, bell curve. I own many tens of thousands of books. I bought a lot of defective books, or what people considered defective, and uh, that's a moving target. What was defective then is not defective today, and uh, I benefited greatly from that observation early on. Books are a pain in the neck, they're heavy. You have, you know, 20, 30,000 books. You have a lot of books. Carter Burden had as many books as I did, if not more. He spent a million and a half dollars on structural reinforcement of his apartment just to put his bookshelves in. The relationship of the individual to the book is very much like a love affair. It's hard to explain to other people, if you can at all, and it's totally satisfying to yourself. My wife said, uh, I realize I'm not first in your life. Your books are. Where do I stand? I paused for about 20 seconds, counting. Sixth. Anyway, and that was not the thing to say, but you live by the sword, you die by the sword. <laughs> I mean, I describe myself as a hunter-gatherer <laughs> because I want the wow factor of having the look at all of these thousands of books. And these are all women who were important, and their stories were important, but they've been ignored. 
I was always a reader. But then when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I got a job at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And then, in the meantime, the women's movement started. I was too lazy to march and do political stuff. But from the library background, and the library company collection was Americana, I noticed that there were no women. It was though the history of women didn't happen, that they were just sort of there on the side knitting or something like that. And it was just a great chasm. I, I thought it was just a little narrow gully, but it was a chasm into which I jumped and uh, started collecting. And I had to educate the dealers. I had to educate the librarians as to what I was looking for. And most of the dealers were men. And I would say, show me where your women are. And they go, we don't have any. And I would come back with the stack and they go, ah, oh, OK, so now we know. And they were not expensive. I mean, except the Indian captivities. Those have always been collectible and collected. And then my second husband was also a book collector. And we traveled and hunted books. She was really one of the first to recognize the importance of collecting women and not collecting men writing about women, although she occasionally does let the, you know, a male author in if he's done something worthwhile, but collecting women talking about women. It's almost 25,000 items, but that also includes art, photography, all sorts of tchotchke. I mean, if you're going to have a collection and you intend to exhibit it, having a whole bunch of books open at the title page is really boring. So you need things like Annie Oakley's gloves. Caroline has got an eye for the quirky, but also for the historically important. And she's built up a fantastic network of people who can help her realize what will be her defining role in life, which will be to have the greatest collection of American women, writers, and history makers that there is. I feel I have a responsibility to form this collection. I mean, it's enormous fun, but it has evolved into something that I feel is important and other people will see that it's important. And, you know, I don't have kids, so I can spend my uh, funds however I want, yay. In 2017, we started an annual prize of $1,000 for the best book collection built by a young woman in the United States. And we did this because we wanted to encourage young collecting generally, but also because we really wanted to encourage women who are collecting books or accumulating books to start thinking about themselves critically as collectors. Many people think that collecting is just about high spots and first editions, and you need an enormous amount of money. The truth is, the most interesting collections are built by people who see something that other people don't see. It's not people who are buying the books everybody already knows. I think most people stumble into this book world. They don't look for it and aim for it. And my stumbling upon it was a job application in Las Vegas, of all places. I was on my way to graduate school planning on becoming an academic, and instead I thought, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I applied, and then within only a few weeks of starting there, I thought, oh no, no, this is what I'm doing for my life. This is my career. Judging the condition of a book is sort of like an art form. How's it going? Not bad, how are you? Good, that's why I called her Rebecca, because she knows how to do it. What do we have? There were a lot of results from being on Pawn Stars. There were some good things, there were some bad things, but in the end, the thing that mattered to me about it was that it was an exercise in bridge building. The idea was that for up to seven million viewers in a night, people would see the basics of rare books and collecting on the show. If it works out nicely, it could be up to 14,000, I would say. Okay, you know, she just nice. made everything more complicated. That's what I do. <laughs> yes, there's something inherently funny about a pawn shop in Las Vegas being the bridge we're using to introduce people to rare books and manuscripts. But that's the vehicle, fine, I'll take it. Can I hold it up to the light? Sure, sure. But one of my favorite, favorite things is when I get messages from parents who talk about like their little girl who was a bookworm who saw me on Pawn Stars, and they're saying, oh, no, she wants to be a bookseller, too. One thing that has been frustrating to me is when I started in the rare book trade full time in 2004, the ABA was about 85% male. 
But I was told that like at any minute this was going to change. There were waves of women coming. That just give it a second. The demographic's going to tip. It's going to be all different. And you know, now it's 15 years later and it's 85-15 still. Yes, there are famous women book dealers who own their own business like Rostenberg and Stern. But looking at them as these sort of exceptions and a small percentage of business owners that are women is undercutting what's really the case in the culture of rare books, which is that women have been here and contributing the entire time. They have been cataloging, they've been doing a lot of the work behind the scenes. And these women were really respected for their book knowledge. I mean, people like Mabel Zahn and Kid Curry, they really were forces in the trade, but often are underrepresented in the historical record, certainly, because their names weren't on the letterhead, their names weren't part of the owner, the business. People used to come into the store and ask a question of the only man there rather than come Who to me. Who was the janitor, It right? could have been the guy on the elevator, mm. it could have been a customer, whatever. So I'd be the last resort. It still happens a little. It doesn't it's happen not, much. Not as bad as it used to be. In one of the oldest institutions for book collecting in New York, the Groller Club, did have an old boys club feel to it for a very long time, not even allowing women members until well into the second half of the 20th century. I'm a member now, Heather's a member now, but for a long time, this was a space in which women were not welcome. And then when Grolier took the step to say, okay, we're going to allow women members, this was well into the period where Rostenberg and Stern had established their reputation. Everyone knew them. And so they very respectfully just applied, asked, what do we need to do in order to become members? And they received a letter back from a secretary essentially saying, well, you have to prove your commitment to books with this idea that it's Rostenberg and Stern people. And they themselves thought, oh, OK, so this is just more of the same, is it then? And they said, no, I think we'll pass. Now, of course, the Grolier has Rostenberg and Stern's papers. So they have eventually come around to the idea that they long since proved their bookish passions. Fundamentally, the profession has largely been a service profession that has catered to the collecting interests of affluent white men. And, you know, we can't take the standards of kind of like cultural and political ethics of today and frame the past as a bunch of, you know, these were goons and misogynists. And, and I really want to be clear about that. But I don't think the trade will remain relevant unless the trade changes and grows to encompass other points of view, because it won't be reflective of the population of readers and thinkers and collectors that exists. Often I'm the black person at the walk on the floor. I think that's changing, but we have to think about the diversity of the material we're circulating because I think that's what helps bring people into the trade. I started collecting because I was writing about the stuff I was collecting, and I still remember the books I got from dealers that were key to me and still are treasured. There's a lot of people in the old guard that are not really interested in getting anything new happening. They don't like the boat being rocked. It's the same thing that's happening, you know, in our country. People talk one way and act another way. Among older dealers, there is just this total sense of fatalism that like, yeah, well, that's just who buys the books. How are you going to make it diverse? I mean, I think that's a question we are all actively struggling with. It's very difficult to get these people, many of whom pride themselves on how contrary they are, to agree on anything. You just have to, you know, continually try, person by person, over and over and over again, to move the needle a little bit. And if we hit a wall, we'll go around it and we'll try something else. This is because we know that change needs to happen for the future of the trade. I'm interested in how culture moves and how culture changes. I'm interested in archival silences and omissions. I'm interested in the history of this moment that we're living through. And so I think there are all these subterranean kind of points of connection that we can look to that were not given to us in the nightly news when we were growing up. I'm interested in conflict materials. I'm not just interested in Afghanistan specifically. I mean, that's the place where I've been most involved. And what I think is fascinating is to find ephemeral paper traces of those conflicts. The paper is a psychic capacitor. And if I get a charge from something, it's kind of like I know it when I see it, when I pick it up and I think, wow, this is changing my perception instantly as I read it. 
that's the kind of material that's exciting to me. And I don't think book collectors buy objects, I think they buy stories. What are people of my generation and the coming generations interested in? They're interested in political economy. They're interested in questions about capitalism and socialism. They're interested in gender. They're interested in experimental music and the avant-garde and the long chain of history that connects Dada and surrealism to punk and hip hop. They're interested in drug culture, in sexuality. They're interested in exploration of identity. A few years ago, I worked with Michael Holman on the placement of his archives. He's the journalist who first used the words hip hop in an article that was printed in the East Village Eye in 1982. You know, when you look at hip hop as it started to exist in the late 1970s and early 1980s, you know, this was a cast of dozens at that time. And by 1984, Def Jam was releasing million seller records, right? And so, MTV takes off and runs with it in the golden age of hip hop by the early 1990s, you know, you have the world's attention. And that's that commitment to this originary space of culture where people are participating enthusiastically. They don't believe what's about to happen. They're not thinking about what's about to happen. They're doing it authentically on their own terms. And the culture sees that. The culture wants that. And that to me is what people are collecting today, what's interesting this dreaming together on paper uh, that happened prior to the internet. Hip hop, people didn't think it was gonna last, let right, alone right. us being 40 years in, 45 years in, like archiving right. and preserving it. Right, archiving what? and preserving it, what does that mean? Right? Yeah, that exactly. Mean? When I started collecting, I didn't think about it as collecting. But it's literally going down a rabbit hole. It's like once you start, once you start, the fun don't stop. A lot of people, like, late 20s, have this crazy sense of nostalgia, right? So I think of a distinct moment in which I fell in love with hip-hop. I was at my grandmother's house, sitting on the step, waiting for my uncle and my cousin to come home. They come home. How I know that they are here is my uncle has this SC400 Lexus. It's cream. It's 95. You hear the Lex Coops, the Beamers, and the Benz by the Lost Boys blasting out the car. Him and my cousin walk in. She has on a DKNY bodysuit that Little Kim has wrapped about DKNY, oh my, I'm jiggy. And my uncle has on a Versace silk shirt with a matching shade, which is known for something that Biggie Smalls used to wear. And they walk in the house, and I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I need to be down with it. And so I was writing for an online hip hop history magazine, and later they asked me to become the editor in chief. I said, cool, not having any experience. And then I realized maybe I should know some writers or editor in chiefs that wrote about hip hop. And during that time, the only person I knew about was Dream Hampton. So I started to Google, but I couldn't find their work online. Like a lot of the work, Double XL, Vibe Magazine, The Source, happened in like the 90s and none of that stuff is digitized. So that led me to collecting their work because I wanted to read Kevin Powell's Tupac story or I wanted to read Greg Tate in The Village Voice and all of these writers. And the only way I could do that is if I literally bought the magazine. Everything that I do is always gonna be around archiving and preserving. Like thinking about what new content can be created so that the generations that were born when Biggie Smalls died now has like context around why he was important, why he was the king of New York, etc. This is what I'm talking about, phase two, right? Ooh. So phase did the layout, the graphic design for IGT, you know, the last couple of issues of it yeah, super uh, clean. from issue four. Before there was television, I would say probably more people did read, because there was no other entertainment you could have in your house. More status used to attach to it. People used to pretend to read more. Because when I was young, novelists were much more important in the culture than they are now. I mean, to me, a book is the closest thing there is to a human being. That's why I think that writers are like gods. Books had a 550 year run. They were a perfect object in many ways. But as the interest in the book has diminished and I think that the last 10 years has seen the beginning of the end of the book as a central object in our culture and there are a dozen reasons for why but you start with the internet and then move on to uh, mobile devices and the shattering of people's concentration uh, but reading as an activity is receding into the background.
I speak to my friends who work for the New York Times, I speak to my friends who, who are in the book business, and, and people are not reading books anymore. And that's going to slow down dramatically the, uh, the, the, the commerce of buying and selling books. You don't spend $25,000 on a first edition of Moby Dick because you want to read Melville. It's the object. And that's what worries me about the future of the book trade. It's just not going to speak to people the way it speaks to people, certainly of my generation. The natural sort of outcome of that line of thought is, you know, if books cease to be printed and if the future is entirely electronic books and we start living in some kind of a science fiction world that's like um, Blade Runner, I think more and more people who were never interested in books will become interested in books again because they are such an artifact. So if, God forbid, books were to cease to exist, I think a whole new cast of people would begin collecting them for different reasons. I think today, though, as the book transcends from the repository of knowledge to the artifact, you're looking at the book in a different eye with different eyes. The 21st century eye is different than the 19th century eye. It's not clear to me that the Codex has lost its magic for people. We don't really have trouble selling books. You know, I think the death of the book is highly overrated. I go on the subway a lot, and the people that I see reading books, actual books on the subway, are mostly in their 20s. This is one of the few encouraging things you will ever see in a subway. And I told this to my editor, and he said that the people who read mostly on the Kindle are mostly in their 40s. Yeah, I don't know why millennials are getting so much slack for, like, killing bookstores. We're carrying it. We're reading. We're buying. As much as this idea that books are dying or they're somehow crumbling, which is, of course, not true, try to open a file from your computer seven years ago. It's a hit or miss proposition. You can, of course, open any book from 500 years ago and think about and read what's there. Books survive in incredible numbers. People don't like destroying them. They don't burn very well. People don't like throwing them away. Even illiterate people won't throw books away because they have this sort of sense of magic in them. I personally have never been able to throw a book away. I have seen books like in trash, and it, to me, it's like seeing like a human head in the trash, even if it's a horrible book. There's something fascinating about choosing to burn books and it's worked incredibly well, which is why it's been used since the beginning of the written word as a way of filling people with terror and dread. But it's also symbolically meaningful because the memory of a culture, of a people, can be erased. The Nazis definitely were the foremost burners of books. Mao Zedong, who had been a librarian, he was a book burner. That hits us profoundly because we really project into books this very subliminal belief that they'll outlast us, that they'll pass our stories along, our knowledge, our dreams, our visions, all of what is the product of human thought. Books survive or don't survive for different reasons. Some of them survive because they were buried in deserts or bogs, and so they were protected. They weren't being handled, they weren't exposed to pollution. They were somehow safe from the bugs that would eat them. Their longevity is incredible. They're real survivalists. I think the main problem now is that the dealers are aging out. When I go to an ephemera fair, almost everybody who's sitting there in a booth has white hair. I deplore the state of affairs in the antiquarian book trade, and my feeling is that it's in its final generations. It will be a niche specialty for a certain range of people. It is consistently my experience as a younger dealer that I am talking to older dealers who are so pessimistic and I am so optimistic. And I find that dichotomy really striking. They're saying, I don't know what you're going to do. And I'm like, I have so many ideas. In America, the rare book firms tend to die with the first generation. It's pretty unusual to go into a second, third and fourth. They're pretty much unknown. Whereas in England, I suppose we're more conservative. My firm's been going since the 1850s. Bernard Quaritch and London be going for the same time. I think most book dealers in the past didn't look ahead when they 
died, whatever happened, happened. So we just keep going the way we have and don't worry about what happens next. Luckily, we have another generation. And we do have Ben who will do whatever is necessary at the time, whether he wants to continue or not. I'm sure this was him. I'm sure. One of the reasons I really got into the business was because of his love for it. I think if he didn't have to worry about money, he probably would have been the greatest collector of all time. He's not a guy who's generally programmed for happiness. You know, he's kind of a cantankerous guy, but he loves everything dealing with rare books. This is what makes him happy. You know, when he gets a new collection in, it's you know, like Christmas. So I think he's happy that this business can continue on if he's not around. My father, he says to other book dealers, look, my daughter's in the business. You know what? My books aren't going to auction. Like that's every bookseller's biggest nightmare is that they have all of these books and they die. And what happens to them? My kids are not interested in running the business and it will go to auction or maybe some of my colleagues will buy. Hopefully it'll be somewhere, all my beautiful babies. I call them my babies. It's just amazing if one of these books could speak to you and tell you what they have heard. I own a lot of books and I'm perfectly happy to go back into the marketplace. Once I'm dead, it won't make any difference to me. There's a handful of things I own that belong in institutions, and those things will be donated or traded. However, the vast majority of things that I own belong back in private hands, so I'm going to put them back into the stream where people will love them and take care of them just like I did. The intention at this point in time is the University of Pennsylvania. Right now they have the fiction section. And of course, I've always wanted to keep it together. I mean, there's no point in pivoting and then dispersing it at auction. That would be completely counterintuitive and stupid. It sounds ridiculous to say, I'm not that much interested in money. I'll even sell a book for less than it cost us if it was going to somebody who, I hate to use the expression, deserves it but who really wanted it and couldn't afford to pay more. Getting the book to the right home is the same way as a doctor works to cure a patient. Even if they don't like the patient, it's their obligation. And I don't regret anything that I've owned and sold. The only thing I regret are the books I never bought. my third fair in five weeks. I've been back for a week and a half, and uh, Wednesday is the next one. It's always a question of how we get, if we get some space for the band. It's all of this, and then uh, that's a good one. Yeah, why don't we start bringing the wooden ones in? The whole thing. This is my 45th New York Book Fair. The first fair I did was still the Plaza Hotel. I think at that point there were maybe 85 exhibitors in the whole thing. It was a little bit more Wild West in feeling in the, in the early days. I've been in business 40 years. It's hard to believe. Not even 40. My, Come on, you're not, not even 40. I'm not even 40. Everyone's happy about it. We're going to have champagne. I hope you can come and have some. You have to drop your cameras. You'll have to use both hands because we don't want any spillage. In the immortal words of Wishy, my catering mentor, the bottle of champagne when open should make the sound of a lady sigh. Some of us think about this all the time, others less frequently. I know what a few of you will say about this, but like, 
If you could do it again, I mean, like, here we are, we're booksellers, right? Or, or we deal in material culture and we gather it, and there's obviously a love for it. It's, it's frustrating at times, but is this something you wake up and you say, thank God, I, you know, I found this? What else would you rather do? I agree. No, I love it. I love it. In 1999, I was laid off from AB Bookman's Weekly, <laughs> and it was like going from writing the sports column to playing baseball. And, wow. you know, That's I would do it again. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I would never go into it. No, <laughs> no, I would never be a bookstore. But I don't know many Why? people who love it as much as what Adam loves is the hunt. I love finding them, I love the discovery. But as a business, Ugh, I mean, the supply business. is limited, the demand is limited, but the business itself is hard. You have to be a psychologist to sometimes buy and sell the book. <laughs> you have to be a brilliant salesman. True. Yeah. You yeah. Sales, yeah. And sales is not like normally. No, you have to be a 49er. Like, like it has, yeah. you have to find the gold in the ground. I mean, it has all these elements that make it an impossible business. So. And on top of all that, the it's, good part. It's, it's hard on the body. Yeah. I mean, you talk about getting up in the morning, but physically, I mean, you look at booksellers walking down aisles at the New York Book Fair. <laughs> it's not all like the the joints are wrong. You know, something. The average is, bookseller loses about seven inches after the age forty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I never had those seven inches. You were about six yeah, foot two I, when you were twenty, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> In silence between writer and reader, a memory of words and hands takes form. We learn substance and worth through others' eyes. Cloth, flesh, ink, skin, paper, dust. These are but material forms in which ideas dwell. In the roar of a crowded shelf of books, desert sun and arctic night, distant seas of thought awaken, mingle, and are still. Minds meet where the reading hand grasps the void and inks its passage in empty margins. Lost, forgotten, thumbed, split, we bear the scars of patient decades and centuries' dreams. Whose hands will next hold me, I do not know. The book, too, reads its readers in real time. I really don't want people to borrow books. I don't. They're not going to give them back. They don't remember. I lent a book to David Bowie once. I said, I don't want to lend you this. You can buy this book. He said, just lend it to me. I'm going to give it back to you. He never did. 